My slides have gone a little bit strange, but I will begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we're all meeting. And for us here, it is the Gadigal people of the great Eora Nation. I'd like to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, and all Aboriginal people who are with us today. And we're very lucky in Sydney Local Health District to have a long-standing relationship with the Aboriginal Medical Service Redfern, the oldest Aboriginal medical service in the country, and the Metropolitan Aboriginal Land Council. And together with our community, we want to have the healthiest Aboriginal community in Australia. I hope everyone is wanting to beat us as well. Um, we all need to do that. Um, you are actually in South East Sydney, Sydney local health districts, just around the corner. Um, and we have a local population of just over 740,000. But the difference with us is that we have about a million people who come into our district every day, day to study, work and play. Um, and um, that makes virtual health something that's really important to us and I'll explain. We provide a range of tertiary and quaternary services, not only to our local community, but very importantly, to our rural and remote communities. And I'm going to share some of our experiences with you. My slides actually jump to one of our case studies that I want to talk about. But before I do, I just want to talk a little bit about some of the challenges in virtual healthcare. And you are all familiar with that, and I'm sure that's what you spent the morning talking about the complexity of the health system and our health services. How do we integrate digital health into our healthcare ecosystem? The absolute um, exponential growth in digital innovations, which ones should we use? I mean, I have every man and his dog literally coming to my door selling me an app. Um, our workforce capabilities in digital health, and I'm not just talking about our amazing um, digital health and innovation staff, also our clinicians, our nurses, doctors, allied health and clinical support staff, their knowledge and capabilities in digital health and resource allocation, having the right people and our funding models which aren't really fit for purpose in a digital world. So I'm going to talk about two case studies for you. Um, one is um, our virtual ICU and this is really special to us and to Broken Hill. It's, it's a partnership. This is not Sydney Local Health District going into Broken Hill and telling them how to do their business. The thing that I love about this partnership is that it's a true and meaningful partnership at every level. And there are real challenges in Broken Hill around transport. There are, there are two planes a day and there are issues with the pilot hours, the weather, bariatric patients, we have times where you can't airlift someone out. We've got competing uh, priorities in terms of our remote sites uh, versus urgent Broken Hill transfers. We've got an issue about our First Nations people not wanting to be removed from country. Um, how do we manage that? And making sure that we're providing culturally appropriate care. And I'm just going to go back, and this is our partnership painting, and this is one of the ways that we gave confidence in our virtual care program with Broken Hill. We had an artwork done by one of our wonderful Aboriginal artists in Sydney Local Health District, an artwork done by a wonderful artist in Broken Hill. And then a good friend of ours, an Aboriginal artist, brought it all together in this partnership painting that is everywhere. It's not just a painting, it's a way of working. So the virtual ICU has a number of components. It has our wonderful colleagues in Far West Local Health District, uh, our clinicians and managers in Sydney Local Health District, the retrieval services, including Medical Control Centre and the Royal Flying Doctors, and our colleagues at Royal Adelaide who've provided support to Broken Hill for a long time. We're not replacing Royal Adelaide. What we're doing is we're bringing everyone together in a much stronger partnership. And it has provided us with an opportunity to support existing care at Broken Hill by linking with the specialised services of RPA, which is a level six ICU. So what it does is it complements and augments the current services in Far West Local Health District and the existing collaborations. Oops, now it's not moving. 
So why and what is it that we're doing that is building confidence? One is it's about access 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year to the expertise and support of a level six ICU. It is enhancing the care of our, for our critically unwell patients and enables high quality consultation at any time that the Broken Hill folk need to have support. So we have someone available to them as a priority 24 hours a day. Safer, enhanced, coordinated retrievals of critically, uh, critically ill patients. Um, and this helps uh, Royal Adelaide because if a clinician at RPA says this patient needs retrieval now, they get retrieval now. And this was one of the challenges that our Broken Hill colleagues had, that they've been told, no, you'll be able to manage this patient um, when they didn't feel that they had the skills and capabilities to adequately manage them. But what's also really exciting is that we've been able to keep more patients on country uh, because they've got the support. The staff, the nurses, the doctors, allied health staff now have the support of a quaternary hospital in the management of those patients. And our staff in RPA have a care pod where they have full access to the EMR and monitoring and they've got cameras that they keep saying can go down to the hair follicle and they literally can. And we're linked through Teams um, with Microsoft Teams. Someone said to me the other day, it's just a glorified Microsoft Teams program. And I went, actually, much more complicated than that and much more integrated than that. So we're able to keep people on country, but when we can't keep them on country, we're able to give them confidence that that retrieval was really necessary. And so the satisfaction of our patients and their families has significantly increased. And so is the confidence of our clinicians in Broken Hill and the, clinician, and, and the patients and their families in Broken Hill. So we've seen a greater confidence for the community in Broken Hill being able to manage critically unwell patients through that partnership. And we've been able to provide education, development and training for the clinicians. And I'm not just talking about the Broken Hill clinicians. I'm talking about the RPA clinicians because Broken Hill has so many strengths and particularly the work with our First Nations people. And that has really benefited RPA and that partnership really benefits Broken Hill. And if virtual health is going to be effective, it has to be built on strong partnerships and strong governance. I am going to talk, because those slides seem to have disappeared, about RPA virtual. Because if it wasn't for RPA virtual, we wouldn't be able to do virtual ICU in Broken Hill. And RPA virtual is the first truly digital hospital um, in Australia. We developed, it's not telemedicine, it's not telehealth, it is a truly virtual hospital. And we started developing RPA Virtual in 2019, prior to COVID. I went to Israel, I got the projections for the emergency department of RPA, they gave me the horrors, it was bigger than Canterbury Hospital, the whole of Canterbury Hospital, uh, it said that couldn't work. We need to do something different. We need a new model of care that would give the community confidence. And so we started on this journey of RPA virtual. I gave our team the task of having it up and running by the end of January 2020. They did say to me, do you mean 2022, 23, I went, no, 2020. And luckily, RPA virtual started on the 3rd of February 2020, the same day that WHO announced the pandemic. And if it wasn't for RPA Virtual, we wouldn't have been able to manage 24,000 people within the quarantine hotel. So 265,000 people came through the New South Wales Health Quarantine Program. Of those, anyone who was COVID positive, who was, was at risk of being COVID positive, or had a clinical condition not appropriate to be in a police managed hotel, came to the special health accommodation. And it literally was a subacute hospital in apartment blocks, supported by RPA Virtual, but also supported by face-to-face -face clinicians 
on the ground, but able to pull in the full resources of our specialist services from RPA and Concord into the special health accommodation. And you say, what sort of things other than COVID? Well, there were things like patients who'd had recent neurosurgery, patients who were antenatal. Boy, did we have a lot of antenatal patients. We had a lot of children with autism and developmental problems, and they were with us for at least two weeks. And remember, this was at a time where there was no vaccination, so the risks to the community were significant. At one point, we had 1,200 people being managed effectively with a great electronic medical record and with RPA virtual in apartments. 1,200 people, safely. So how could that be? We could do that because right at the beginning, before we saw a patient with RPA virtual, we set up a really strong governance structure, a really strong clinical governance structure. It has the same structure as a hospital with all of the same clinical governance that you would have in a hospital. And in fact, this year, RPA Virtual will be going through uh, accreditation as a hospital against the national standards, the first virtual hospital to do that. So how have we been able to do that and give confidence to our patients and to the community? So for me, it's about having a clear vision and the vision we have is excellence in health and healthcare for all. And virtual health is also about equity, making sure that everyone has access. And virtual health has an opportunity to increase the reach of our services and make sure that everyone, including people in our vulnerable communities, has access. So in RPA Virtual, we have a whole team that take devices out to our patients. They don't have the money for it. We provide the virtual devices to enable that to occur. It's also about culture. Um, and a culture that really respects and values all peoples. Um, and what we've found, and I have to say, I was a bit ageist, I have to admit it. So when we started on the journey, I thought young people will be much more into RPA virtual than older people. I couldn't have been more wrong. Older people love RPA virtual. It's really convenient for them. They feel safe. There's been a real focus on the provision of high quality, safe patient care. The reason RPA Virtual has worked and Virtual ICU has worked is that the quality of care is central to the provision of care. So we have very well document, documented care paths. We've done research and we're continuing to do research to show the impact of RPA Virtual and Virtual ICU on the care of our patients. The care has all been about being patient and family uh, focused. Um, so being able to engage family members has increased their confidence that virtual care is not a, um, is not, uh, a secondary uh, type of care, that it's actually high quality integrated care and visible leadership. So making sure that our senior clinicians as well as our junior clinicians and managers are really visible in the establishment of our virtual care services. And I've talked about having effective governance. Robust planning. So this is not a fly-by-night activity. We have very well-developed plans to make sure that the infrastructure is right, the training is right, and very importantly, we've got the right staff in the right place at the right time. And some of that actually means face-to-face -face care. Because I really believe strongly virtual care is not an end in on of itself. It is a tool and it has to be integrated into the whole care system. The strength of it, if you've got the care paths right, is that we can identify early those patients who need to escalate to face-to-face -face care. And I was talking earlier about the importance of making sure that you've got a relationship with a care provider. So I actually don't think you can have one virtual centre that does all of Australia, because care has to be um, integrated into the care relationship, the patient and clinician relationship, not just on the end of the phone, not just in virtual, uh, in video conferencing, but having 
a trusting relationship with a care team, not an individual clinician, but with a care team, and, and making sure that it's data-driven and technology-supported, not technology-driven, because we thought that we would have so much technology and so many apps and we'd be just so clever. And sometimes it's the simple things that are what the patient needs, not the complex technologies. And really understanding the risks. Understanding the risks and right from the beginning, putting in place strategies to mitigate those risks. Very importantly, understanding the finances because it's got to be sustainable. So we put a lot of effort in working with the state and the Commonwealth about how you fund virtual care. And understanding what the impact is of digital health on the patient and the provider experience. And I do have some slides that will be available that actually shows you some of the results um, from our surveys of both our patients and our staff on their experience with digital health. But I'll leave that for another discussion because I know that we need to finish now. Uh, I think the journey around virtual health is a really exciting one. It can actually help to address the inequities that we have in health, but it can't be seen as something in isolation. It has to be integrated into a high quality health system. Thank you. Um, I thought this morning was pretty good, um, but for a Kickstarter after lunch, that was very impressive. Um, would anybody like to ask some questions? We've got a few minutes before we'll be asked to uh, move on. Uh, Tim Shaw. Thanks, Theresa. Um, it was an interesting point you raised about how, how distributed can virtual care be? We've obviously got health direct at a national level where you can phone up and you don't know the person. But I think you were implying in your conversation there as you start to drop down into that virtual care kind of column, the further down you get, the more you have to have immediacy and actually have a small kind of layer of, of your team around you. So it's an interesting concept. So I mean, do you want to reflect a bit more on that? Because obviously we yeah. can layer it. We do. We can have things at a state, things at a national level in that virtual care. But you're saying we need to keep it pretty intimate. Absolutely. Down at the delivery level. I think it's a bit like, I like concentric circles. What are the things you've got to have near you, close to you? And what are the things you can have more distantly? And I, ha I love Health Direct. I think it has a really great function. Um, but in our discussions with Health Direct, they can't do the things that RPA Virtual is doing. Um, and it requires access to the electronic medical record. Um, it requires being able to get visibility of imaging, but it also, and other diagnostics, but it also requires a relationship. A relationship, the reason VICU is working is that we have a relationship between the clinicians at Broken Hill and the clinicians at RPA. They know each other. We've actually moved them across facilities so they get to know each other even at a deeper level so that we develop trust. And I think it's really hard to only develop trust virtually. We all wanted to come here today to be in person. You know, and I think if, if COVID has shown us anything is that we as human beings are social beings. We like to be with other people. And there has to be a face-to-face -face component in these relationships or it's not a relationship. Anybody else got a, a burning question? While the microphone is just making its way over, is there something personal that you're really proud of that was solved in this really complicated and complex uh, setup? Um, I think one of the things I'm most proud about is the fact that we did something that we didn't think that we could do. Um, if you think about the special health accommodation, there's no way we could have done that without RPA Virtual and without the maturity of the electronic medical record that we have in Sydney Local Health District. Um, and I'm really proud of the fact that our staff took a risk, it is a risk, but in a very controlled manner. Terrific. Hello, thank you. I'm a huge admirer of RPA Virtual, especially from the start and I've come and had a tour and everything. I've, I know that RPA Virtual uses remote monitoring, telehealth to really address um, episodic care. 
So I'm wondering how you can scale or expand a virtual hospital like RPA Virtual to enable integrated care, so connecting your patients with their primary physicians or their outpatient physicians. Um, do you have plans for that? And if so, how Absolutely. would you go about it? Thank you very much. That's a great question. And I think the relationship with our primary care practitioners is really critical. Um, and we've worked very closely with RPA Virtual, with the GPs within our area. Um, and the feedback we have from the GPs is really positive because we have a virtual care centre that supports the GPs in their decision making. Um, luckily, with, within our district, we had invested quite significantly in health pathways. Um, and so we have this infrastructure that helps to support those relationships and RPA Virtual basically builds on that. And we have some patient cohorts, so particularly in rehabilitation. So we've been doing virtual rehabilitation. I have to share a very quick story. I was at the 50th anniversary um, of the um, Aboriginal Medical Service Redfern. We had a great ball in Sydney Local Health District. We love a party. Uh, and it was a great party. And an Aboriginal elder from Murrumbidgee came up to me. I didn't know her. I was with Susan Pearce, the secretary. She gave me the biggest hug in the history of the universe, which was really nice. And she said, I love RPA Virtual. Um, I had a stroke. I came into RPA. Um, I needed rehabilitation, but I needed to be home. I've been having uh, virtual rehabilitation with RPA Virtual on country. It's the best thing since sliced bread and everybody should be able to do it. Um, and so we've been wor and working with the local clinicians um, within Murrumbidgee to provide care to that patient. So I think that's a journey that we're all on. I don't think RPA Virtual should be taking over the care relationship that we have between general practitioner and the patient but really being there as a support and to provide specialist services. Now, I'm going to get fired as a, a, a moderator shortly, but Rajni Nair online has one quick question about diagnostics and OBS and, and there being a remote monitoring uh, system in place between the two ICUs. So um, RPA ICU has complete visibility of all monitoring uh, in Broken Hill. We have uh, fixed... Um, cameras and all of the monitoring devices linked through our information system. Um, we have full visibility of the electronic medical record. And in addition to the fixed cameras, we also have mobile cameras. So um, our staff have participated in resuscitations, um, in ward rounds, you name it, we participate in it, just as if we were there. Terrific. I see that you're ready for World Pride. I wholeheartedly approve. Thank uh, Dr. Anderson again for um, a really terrific uh, talk this afternoon.